Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. This is Corey from CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com and I just saw The Invisible Man, written and directed by Lee Whannell. So The Invisible Man is a new version of the old horror classic, The Invisible Man, only this time we flip the script and instead of following behind the scientist who is The Invisible Man, uh, we're following his fiance, Cecilia Cass, as uh, she leaves him and uh, he commits suicide, but she sort of keeps has, having the sense that she's being followed, uh, and we go on from there. One of the questions I've been asking myself since I saw the movie is, what is the place of sort of like these iconic monster movies, specifically the ones that Universal has as like part of their fold? So uh, Mummy and Invisible Man and Dracula and Frankenstein... Like, where do these fit in sort of a modern film landscape? And I think that The Invisible Man did a good job of putting it into a modern context. And I think that it did a good job in flipping the script and not making it about following, you know, The Invisible Man as he goes crazy, but rather sort of seeing the path of his victim uh, and how it, how it treats them. So far, I'm with you. Uh, I think that the idea of doing modern versions of sort of these horror classics is a good idea in general. I think that the more recent push and like The Mummy and stuff like that to sort of make these, these huge tentpole action movies was a little bit much. And I think that Universal is overall in the right place with sort of like working with Blumhouse to make these movies fast and cheap and bankroll other ones. Again, all with it. My problem with The Invisible Man, I think, is that they try and touch on an issue that is more common in modern cinema with, like, sort of the abused woman escaping, trying to find freedom and stuff like that, uh, as the crux of like what makes this movie go um i felt personally watching it like all the things that you know she was saying she you know like the things she was saying out loud were crazy but there's a common refrain within women who are in abusive relationships where they say things immediately afterwards and they're seen as crazy and they're not believed and it's like no your rich boyfriend would never hit you like that um and while she's saying things like i feel like i still feel him around or like you know like she she's expressing that he's still here that he's in his invisible suit and that he's causing chaos you have to, you know, that, that part would sound weird if you brought it up in normal everyday conversation. But the fact that we're having people act like they don't believe everything she's saying makes it more difficult for me to sort of get in on the movie. Just because it, it I, I don't want to necessarily watch a movie where a woman is complaining about things post uh, breakup for you know, like a, a, a uh, abusive relationship and then spend the next hour and 15 minutes of the movie not listening to anything that she says. Like, I, I get why the characters don't do it because what she's saying is not usual. But it, it's like we didn't have, it, have to have it be an abusive relationship where people stop listening to her as a reason to get going. It, it just it set me off on a bad foot. It just reminds me of... I had seen a movie once uh, with somebody who had been sexually assaulted, and in that movie, there was a scene of sexual assault. And I remember when I walked out of the movie at the time, when I first saw it, like, first initial reaction was uh, that scene was very uncomfortable. The, the, the rape, the sexual assault was very uncomfortable. And I said, I think it, in my mind, it lasted just long enough where I didn't start getting disgusted by it. And the person that I was with who saw the movie, who had been a victim of that before said no amount of time that that was on the screen 
was good enough for me. Like I was, I was immediately uncomfortable and wanted to leave within the first couple seconds of it happening. And as filmmakers, we want to try and like create worlds where we can say things and change the way that we feel about the world that we live in and maybe, uh, impact it for good in some sort of way and to entertain people. And I just don't, I think there was a more eloquent way to tell the story without having to do something that will make a certain percentage of the audience feel unlistened to or make them feel unwelcome. And, you know, like I get if you're making a movie, you know, like I don't like space. I don't like space movies. It's not like a thing that like gets me going. So if you say, hey, new space movie coming out. I'm less interested in wanting to see it just because I don't like space. That's different. That You're automatically eliminating customers who probably want to be interested in the product in the beginning. If you're bringing people in and they don't know that there's this whole emotional abuse or sexual abuse or <laughs> physical abuse or whatever it may be, there is some sort of abuse happening. Uh, we, it, it, it's, uh, you know, like I, 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 I feel like the the phrase like trigger warning has sort of like been co-opted by people who want to lessen its impact and stuff like that. But I, I, I feel like this movie didn't do enough to protect people once they got in. And it's not that they can't tell a story about emotional abuse. It's just that I wish they would have spent a little bit more time actually digging into it and making it more of like, you know, they, they had plenty of throwaway moments that they could have spent like sort of unpacking what she was going through or just give her an opportunity to like, sort of like talk about it and like make, you know, work her way through it. Uh, it, it just, it, it left a sour taste in my mouth that sort of stuck with me throughout the entire movie. It was hard to, to break. All that being said, I thought that Elizabeth Moss did a fantastic job in this movie. I don't think that uh, any problems that I have with how this movie sort of dealt with the uh, ramifications of the abuse was her fault at all. I thought she carried it really well. I feel like Elizabeth Moss is one of our better actors, and she's really good. She carries this movie all by herself. She does a, a fantastic job. There's a part of me that wishes that there was just a little bit better of supporting character play or at the very least a supporting actor who is sort of on her level. And that's not to uh, disparage like Aldous Hodge or Storm Reed or, you know, any of the people that she's playing across from uh, her sister, uh, Elizabeth Cass, played by Harriet Dyer uh, or Michael Dorman the uh, brother of her fiancé, her, her deceased fiancé. I mean, I, you know, all these people are fine. They, they, do, they do work. It, it's just, I, I don't feel like the characters for any of these people are written particularly deep. I mean, like, I kept thinking anytime James Aldous Hodge's character was speaking, it, it sort of felt like it was the thing to set up the next one like it, it it was he was there to to be exposition he was there to move things along he was like it, it didn't seem like he was given much opportunity to really shine much the same that elizabeth moss was and you know not every role has to be you know not every role is a starring role but i mean like the opportunity to write secondary and tertiary characters who are interesting is a huge joy of the horror genre and spe specifically you get a chance to put people in to these lesser roles and let them shine i mean part of the reason why danny trejo is so loved is that he would show up in these horror movies he'd play a bit character he'd knock it out of the park and then people would see trejo and just be like oh he's in this one too thank god like i mean that's that's sort of the joy of horror is being able to find fun places for for secondary and third tertiary characters but it's just not the not the same thing here like just nobody else really seems to be given an opportunity to run with the ball at all and i don't feel like it's 
any of the actors' fault, per se, and I don't even necessarily think it's, like, the problem with the script. I just feel like it's missed opportunity, if you will. Now, that being said, sort of, like, on the filmmaking side of it and the craft of it all, I think that this movie is a perfect example of sort of being a inch deep but a mile wide as opposed to being a mile deep and an inch wide. Uh, it it tries to touch lightly on a lot of subjects and sort of like move across them, but it doesn't ever really spend time truly examining what uh, it's all about. Like, for instance, I thought that the way that they would shoot sort of like open, blank uh, screens where nothing was happening was, uh, you know, very compelling and it, it, it like made you look at every single inch of the screen looking for what you're, what you're missing. But at the same time, there was a lot of things that were just unmotivated and it was just like, you know, we're going to be playing the scene here and then we're going to have the camera slowly drift towards the door and just hang on the door for a while. But there wasn't anything that sent the camera to the door. It was just an effect to try and make people think that something was about to happen. And horror is about going up to the line, getting right up to it, and then slowly backing back and then going to the line and then coming back slowly. You know, it's the, it's, it, it's the tension and then the release. Like, it's all... It's all this, and I think that there were nice moments where it was, you know, like, properly tense, and then there were times where it just felt like they weren't doing enough to really live within the moment that they were supposed to be playing. It, it just, again, an, uh, another case of what felt like missed opportunities. Just not like, to do certain things, like, you know, like the first whole scene of the movie where she's sneaking out and she's trying to leave before he wakes up or without waking him up, the fiance, the abusive one, you know, that, that all was shot very nicely. I thought, I thought it was good. I thought that uh, there were little things that they were trying to set up for later where she like walks into his laboratory to shut off the cameras and stuff like that. And you sort of see what he's been working on, which will clue us into later. But you know, it, it's sort of like they finished that scene. They were just like, all right, well, we've done enough cool stuff for a while. So we can just, you know, just make the movie as we normally would otherwise. Like it just didn't, it felt like they kind of had this moment and then they lost it. And then they never really quite got it back the same way. It just, it, it felt like they were working off of different versions of how they were going to do the movie at certain points during the film. It just, it felt like not quite concise, not quite all in the same package. And I think that brings me to my overall sort of like feeling about this movie, which is just that the pacing is kind of all over the place at times at the beginning of the movie. Like it felt like we were moving along just right. And then there were times like just sort of like third of the way through halfway through something like that, where it just feels like we're not doing anything. We're just sort of like slogging through, um, and then it picks back up, and then we're slogging. And then it picks back up, you know, like, it, it, it's not the... it It's sort of running serpentine with the idea of, like, running up to the line and then backing up and the tension release, blah, blah, blah. But the actual pacing of the film sort of feels like it's going along with these ebbs and flows, and it's just, like, when we're in a down moment, it just doesn't feel like we're ever going to get out. It just it, it feels forever that we're just living here. The choices overall that were made were not you know, inspiring choice. Like, I, I knew where this whole movie was going the entire time. There was never a moment that it was, like, ahead of me or giving me some sort of fake out. Like, I could... I I was seeing scenes come before they happened, and um, that's not to say that every movie has to be, you know, living on the vanguard and be innovative in every single way, but, you know, a little bit. <laughs> it's like a... You know, like, spend an extra day just try and think about it a little bit. Just come up with ways to give us something a little bit different. And I mean, like, it, I, I guess the reason why that's upsetting is because I feel like the the arena in which we're living this movie in, where we're following from the perspective of the victim as opposed to the invisible man, was already sort of like a 
enough of a shift from what we had seen from previous Invisible Man films that it was going to work as something different. But then that's where they let it lay. They didn't continue to like flesh it out beyond that. I don't know if you can see it, but it's leaderboard time. Um, saw this movie at the AMC Burbank 16 Prime. Uh, good show. I you know I don't think this movie is necessarily. You know, like I wouldn't if if it was my money and I was going to the theater and they said prime or regular, like definition screening, I would just go with the regular. There's nothing about prime that's necessary for this movie, and you know I don't even think it would be available in like a 4DX or a 3D or any other like you know IMAX or Dolby or anything like that. But if it is, you don't need to see it in that. You can just see it in the regular screening. You'll be fine. Uh, I mean, honestly, this movie is probably best suited to be watched with like a bunch of friends like hanging out in an apartment while other things are going on sort of the usual horror movie type of feel on to the movie leaderboard i don't want to blanketly say that this movie is like good or bad like i i it almost feels like an incomplete rather than it does a final grade i i would say that if you are a horror movie aficionado, you are probably not watching this review, figuring out whether or not you want to see this movie. Most of the people I know who are like really huge in horror see everything. Even if they don't see it in theaters, they see it eventually. Like it, eventually, it comes to them. Uh, they find it on Netflix. Somebody tells them to see it. They buy a DVD. Whatever the case may be, horror movie people are going to find this movie. I think they're going to enjoy it fine. It's Again, it's not something that completely changes the scope of how horror movies are supposed to be done. It's just... It, I, it's, it's fairly basic, but it's perfectly fine and entertaining. And, you know, there's moments where I feel like it really, you know, like, stands up for itself. And I think that there's moments that people remember from this movie, even though they might not remember the movie as a whole. I think Elizabeth Moss will be remembered very fondly for this one. And, I mean, we'll sort of see where the Blumhouse uh, Universal remakes of these characters go. I mean, it, 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 to me, it, it seems like this is a promising start to this relationship. It just feels like this movie didn't hit all the marks that it could have. It, didn't, it wasn't the best representation of the movie that I think they were trying to make. That being said, if I had to give it a rating, I would give Invisible Man a 6.9. And I would say that if I were to hypothetically like sort of give this a Fast and the Furious rating, it it's not really like it, it's not the type of horror movie that is like it, it it's trying to be more realistic. It's not trying to be like some sort of campy horror movie. So I don't feel like it really gets affected that much by like sort of a fast and the furious score on this sort of thing. But you know, I give it an extra couple percentage points, like seven, two or something like that, I guess. I mean, it, it's just, it's a perfectly fine average movie with a really good performance by Elizabeth Moss and missed opportunities. And I don't think it's anyone's fault. I think that it's a sort of a hard it's hard to know how the movie is going to play before you even start shooting it. And when you're in the process of it, you, it's hard to put all these pieces together too. And then by the time you have it done, it's either brilliant or it needs some work. And uh, I think that this movie probably is sort of in that position where it's just like, oh, there's a lot of things we could have done differently beforehand, but who knows how it was going to turn out. And this is sort of where we are. Anyway, that's it for me. If you want more, you can go to my website, CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com, Facebook.com forward slash CoreyBakerFilm, or at LegendCB5 on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I don't know what movie I'm going to see next. It's completely open to me. I, there's not, like, a ton of, like, fantastic things out there. I might see that Ben Affleck basketball movie just because, you know, it's out there. Yeah, but other than that, I'm open to suggestions. So uh, if there's something that you would like me to see please put it down in the comments below or hit me up on social media and let me know. Anyway, that's it for me. 
if you don't mind, I have to, uh, oh, you know, just sort of see what people are saying about me, hang out in corners, pry 